Well, all right. Hey, good evening, everybody. Nice to have you out on this Saturday night. Glad you made it out. Made time to be here. Seek the Lord in Matthew 14 with Danny leading us in worship. We're going to be blessed. Why don't we all stand for opening prayer and we'll commit this night to the Lord and all that he has for us. God, we are very blessed to be here tonight. We are thankful to be here tonight. Life is a gift and you've entrusted to it, entrusted us with it this day uh, for each of us. And we thank you for that. And I want to thank you that Gathering together as a body of Christ is important enough to everyone that's come out here tonight or is tuning in to just be here and share this time with you and your people, and I thank you for that. Lord, we ask and pray that you bless this service. I pray you pour out your spirit on Danny as he leads us in worship. I pray that you would pour out your spirit on us as we sing praise songs and give you worship, that we'd be free from distractions and the busyness of life, that we could clear our mind and get the kingdom perspective through singing songs of, about you and your, your glory and eternity. They are songs of the next dimension, so may they move our hearts in that way and our thoughts that way. We pray also to you'd bless the study tonight as we read your word and continue through the gospel of Matthew, that you'd speak to us and encourage us and build us up. Bless the children's ministry tonight, we pray, and we just ask that it just be an amazing night. Bless our conversations, our fellowship. May we build up one another and encourage one another in this gathering for those eternal things that we find in you, Jesus. So give you the service now, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love. As we sing holy, holy, holy. I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Oh, 
creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Waiting for her groom will be a church ready for you every hour longing for our king we sing even so come Lord Jesus come Oh even so come Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride, wait. Ready for you every yard, longing for our King. We sing like a bride, like a bride, waiting for her groom. We'll be church, ready for you every yard, longing for our King. We sing even so. Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, so we wait, so we wait, we wait for you, God, we wait. You're coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait. You're coming soon. So we wait, so we wait. We wait for you. God, we wait. You're coming soon. So we wait. So we wait. We wait for you. God, we
even so come Lord Jesus come I will live for the moments where I'm still in your presence. All noise dies down. Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new, so I surrender all. All I want is to live within your love, be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind I am desperate for a touch of heaven Oh, 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 oh. Mm. You're the fire in the morning you're the cool in the evening, the breath in my soul, or the life in my bones. There is no hesitation in your love and affection. It's the sweetest of all. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart want something new so I surrender all all I want is to live within your love be undone by who you are my desire is to know you deeper Lord I will open up again throw my fears into the I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Oh, 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 Open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can. Jesus, have your way in me now. I open up my heart.
undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Oh, My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. As I rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my sight. As a way, heart of God, satisfy and sustain. As I hear voice of God, lead me on, be my guide, be my guide. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me, as I go, hand of God, my defense by my side. As a rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be Before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, Christ be. be all around me your life your death your blood was shed for every moment every moment your life your death your blood was shed 
for joy. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you. Forever I'll say nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Shout to the Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can shout your name in complete, utter disregard for how it might look, how it might feel, how it might seem. Lord, we know you to be true. We love you. And we do pray that in this time, as we hear from your living word, that we'd glean and grow from what you have to tell us tonight. We love you so much, Jesus, and we thank you for this time that we get to be together. In your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. You guys can greet each other as well. Thank you. All right, everybody. Nice to have you out on the Saturday night. Glad you made it. I announced on Tuesday that after Easter last week, I was going to switch to this pulpit and the handheld for a while. So if you're here Tuesday, you knew I was going to do that. It's okay. You can clap. Maybe you won't clap after service, but you can clap now. That works. But um, and most of the time when I guest speak at other churches, I go with a handheld. I... I find I tend to be more comfortable teaching with a handheld mic. So it wouldn't work on Tuesday because I generally read a lot of texts, right? Three to five psalms, three to five chapters. But it works on Saturday because Saturday is primarily a topical message, even though we're going verse by verse through Matthew. So anyways, I thought about it back at Christmas after the Christmas service. And then after Easter, I thought, no, nah, I'm just going to do it. Why not? I'm 63. New adventures, new things. You just go for it, and uh, you can always pivot and move back to something else if you feel it doesn't work. So anyways, don't be thrown off. You'll get used to it. I remember when I was super self-conscious about using glasses. Do you remember that? Five years ago, I was like so weird. I was like, 
But anyways, I pretty much have to use them now. So back then it was an option. Now it's pretty much mandatory. So a couple announcements. This coming week, we're going to be continuing going forward in the book of Psalms on Tuesday night. And Danny Donnelly will be coming down from Los Angeles to lead us in worship. So we're excited to have Danny out and leading us in worship. And then, of course, we'll have our Saturday service next week. We'll continue in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be in part two of chapter 14. We'll do part one tonight. And I want to remind the guys, this coming Saturday, the 13th, we'll be here in the sanctuary at 7.30 in the morning. We're doing coffee and donuts and the breakfast burritos from Surf Shack down there in Huntington Beach on Main Street. Those awesome breakfast burritos we do only on occasion because otherwise you just expect it all the time. So it's a special thing. So guys, I hope you can make it out. We'll be here. Sam will be teaching. Pastor Sam, looking forward to what the Lord has to share through Sam as he continues to take us through the Gospel of John. So that's what's coming up this week. And I know the ladies gathered today, and I know you had a great time. So ladies, praise the Lord that you were together with Susan Branch and the women this morning here on the grounds. So tonight, if you have a Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14. And as we're going forward in chapter 14, we left off where Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. That's where we were when we left off last week with our applications being, uh, well, two weeks ago with our applications being from the parables. Of course, last week was Easter. And so tonight we're going to because we're going verse by verse, I, you've seen this already in Matthew, I read some text, give the context, and then get to our main text for topical application, and that's what we're doing. So we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 14, and we read that, At this time Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod the Tetrarch had laid hold of John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who had sat with him, he commanded it be given to her. And so he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. You know, there's times when you're going through the Bible, you just read certain passages. You're like, I don't even want to read this. And to be honest, whenever I read about this happening to John the Baptist, it just, it just makes you feel sick. It's, it's dark. It's evil. It, it's just dark and evil. But people who are determined to fight God and are immersed in unbelief while also being exposed to the truth, which Herod the Tetrarch was, they just do dark and evil things. Man is desperately wicked. We're sinful to the core, and we know that. And we need a Savior, and the Savior is Jesus. And Herod the Tetrarch would have heard about Jesus through John the Baptist. We're told in the other Gospels that Herod the Tetrarch had these conversations with John. He would go and converse with him and then, you know, go his way. But he didn't know what to do with him. But he would have these conversations with John. And we know that John the Baptist, his whole ministry was to point people to Jesus. He's the messenger, as it says in Isaiah the prophet. So if you talk with John the Baptist for just a little while, he's going to tell you Jesus is the Son of God. He's going to tell you that Jesus is the Lamb of God, and that's what he's going to do. Now, Herod the Tetrarch is a descendant of Herod the Great, and Tetrarch means a fourth, and he ruled over a fourth of Israel at that time. He had his power base, and he did what he did. He shows up in the last week of Jesus' life as well, demanding a trick or a miracle or something, but it never happens. But we see not only is he a powerful man politically, he's also, a, he's superstitious, right? Like he's saying that John's reincarnated. Isn't it amazing like people who think they're really smart and super powerful have some of the weirdest beliefs imaginable? You ever notice that? Like how can people be that smart and that not smart, right? But they are. And when it comes to religion, people get weird and people get superstitious. And he was superstitious. The Herod family had been around for a while, and they were trained in Rome, Roman education, but they're very aware of the Jewish Old Testament 
and the, the law of God. So when John the Baptist would have reproved him, according to the law, saying it's not lawful, he would have been using Leviticus or Deuteronomy from the law of Moses. And it would have been the truth, and it would have pierced him. But it didn't pierce him enough to kill John the Baptist, because being a politician, he feared the multitude, and he just wanted to stay in power. But the wife that he had that he stole from his brother, just that's what bitterness, well, that's what sin does. It hardens the heart and it deceives us, and it turns us over into bitterness. And to be that so filled with wrath and that vile and evil that you could ask for someone's head to be cut off and brought to you, it's something else most of us in this room, probably all of us in this room, could never relate to, and God forbid we could. We want to be the tree of life where it's about Jesus and a future and a hope, but we know there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and war zones reveal it, as does violent criminality. So hopefully we don't have to know more of that tree than we already do or will be forced to know in our journey. But just It's horrible, ugly people. They had the power. Isn't it amazing to think they're in the living word of God for what they did? And the word of God is meant to bring us to Christ for the eternal kingdom. It is amazing to think these people, of all the people that have lived and had power like these people on this level, tens of thousands of them in different ethnic groups and different generations. These are the ones we read about, but they really represent a lot of people we know that are like this with power. And they can take your life because they can. And there's never been a shortage of men and women like this. And there won't be even until the end of the age when Christ returns. But it's just unfortunate. I don't, I don't like to read the story, but it's in the word of God. And it connects us to our main passage tonight. So as we said, as we see there in verse 12, then his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, came and took away the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. That's important because, of course, Jesus is, was a cousin of John via the mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, a a distant relative of some sort, and John had bore witness to him. And they both were fulfilling scripture, of course, Jesus as the savior of the world. And we read in verse 13 going forward that when Jesus heard it, so when he heard about John the Baptist being beheaded, we read that he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is an amazing miracle. It truly is. I mean, Jesus demonstrated his authority over defilement, sin, the grave, the devil, the natural realm, walking on water, which comes up next week, all these things. And here, it's pretty amazing whenever you see movies try and replicate Jesus feeding the 5,000, like, just how did it happen? Like, what did it look like? Where you have five loaves and two fish, and suddenly there's all this food everywhere, and then there's 12 baskets left over. It's an amazing story. What I find interesting in the context, though, is that Jesus had just departed to be by himself. Did you catch that? He's dealing with the reality and the grief and the sorrow of losing a loved one. Now, most of us older people here know what it's like to lose a loved one, right? We know what it's like to be grieving. Sometimes you just want to be left alone. Sometimes you just got to go away. You have to calibrate. It's like shock. I mean, when someone you love and you're close to, they step into eternity. I say it goes to like a black and white movie. It just kind of slows down, it's eclectic, and it just doesn't even seem real, especially if it's sudden death. Now, Jesus probably had prepared himself, because remember, he's the son of God and son of man. Jesus became in all ways like a man for us to relate to us. Therefore, he's able to minister to us in whatever temptation, testing, or trials we face. He's our great high priest, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us. So dealing with the grief and the sorrow of the death of someone you love is is something that Jesus ministers to us in our journey of life. Because when we get to 80 years, we're all going to deal with repeatedly a number of times people we love step into eternity before us. And we know the God of all comfort will comfort us as we go through those things. But we don't often think about Jesus himself 
grieving in a situation like this. Now, we know when he was at the tomb of Lazarus, who was dear to him, and Lazarus stepped into eternity, he was already in the grave, and he wept, right? Jesus wept, and he called forth Lazarus from the grave, but of course, Lazarus would die again. Jesus was constantly surrounded by the grief and the sorrow of people who lost loved ones. Think about when he showed up at the house of Jairus' daughter. Can you imagine the grief and sorrow showing up at a house with one child who was 12, your baby girl, and she stepped into eternity? The depth of grief at that situation in that place? We're told in the Old Testament that Jesus is a man of sorrows, and he can relate to us with our sorrows. And of all the sorrows, while there's great sorrow and physical pain and drawn-out tribulations and trials, the death of someone you love leaving the planet before you leaves a void that is irreplaceable. You can never replace that person. They're going to be a precious memory. We celebrate their lives. That's what we do now in 2024. It's not as much mourning anymore, but we want to celebrate, but we grieve. I've done so many memorials in my lifetime. It's amazing in 36 years of being a pastor how many I've done of all ages, both genders, ethnicities of many diversities. So in the context of the feeding of the 5,000, we don't often think that Jesus was grieving. And it would seem that that first verse implies that there in verse 14 or 13, that he went away by himself. See, Jesus came and he serves and he loves everybody. He ministers to the people, but he's actually getting away by himself, which really gives us insights to the story because one of the most challenging things for all of us is when we want to be alone to have people forced on us and we have to go to this family dinner. We have to do this thing with the job and go with all these people and shake hands and if you're a politician, as they say, kiss babies, right? When you want to be alone and you're emotionally grieving and you're having a hard time, you want to be alone. So suddenly to be in a situation where people are demanding things of you or expecting things of you and you need to get out of your comfort zone and serve them and do things for them, that's what happened to Jesus here. We're told he went to be alone to a deserted place and yet we find that the multitudes followed him from the surrounding cities and from those cities they came, and he did not turn them away. We're told that he healed all of them. He healed them. That's what he did. He didn't turn them away. Well, I'm not sure what the disciples of Jesus would have been thinking, but they would have probably been there when the news came from the disciples of John the Baptist that John had been beheaded by Herod the Tetrarch. So who knows what the disciples of Jesus were thinking about being associated with Jesus. Jesus. You don't know. But at any rate, they're there. They're being taught how to do ministry. This is that part of the ministry of Jesus where he's already being rejected by the religious leaders. We've seen that. And here we have this amazing miracle, feeding 5,000, counting the men. So we know it's, that's a lot of people. There's a lot of people for five loaves of bread and two fish. And you got to know it's supernatural. Any idea of anything, any thought suggesting otherwise is blasphemous. So don't even think that thought. The only way this happened is Jesus performed a miracle, a great miracle. Now, in the context of this miracle, we could call it 12 baskets, because to, to me, what's fascinating about this miracle is he just didn't do it, but when he was done doing it, there was 12 baskets left over. So we start with five, five loaves of bread and two fish, and we end up with 12 baskets. You know, with the, the Lord, there's no randomness, right? Like, 12 isn't random. Like, random is if there have been 13 baskets. When you have 12 apostles and there's 12 baskets left over, that's intentional from the Lord. There's a purpose in that. Like if we're all leaving a food and fellowship and we've got a styrofoam box that Chris prepared for us and there's six boxes and there's six of us, well, hey, we all get to take one home, right? Like, or there's seven and one's left behind, that's random. Or if he made four just for the remaining four people, they'd be like, well, that was intentional. Over 5,000 people were fed. There's 12 baskets full. We're told they're full. And you got to take the leftovers home. So who do you think took the leftovers home? I'm guessing the 12 apostles did. I'm guessing that the lessons that the Lord Jesus had for them about doing ministry when you're out of your comfort zone and you want to send people home is that don't underestimate what you can do with five loaves of bread and two fish. There's 12 baskets left over. They had to go somewhere. Somebody had to pick up those baskets. So can you imagine just saying, hey, guys, grab the leftovers. And... All of a sudden, you look around, there's not one basket. All 12, including Judas, they all have a basket. No one's got, there's not 13 left behind, the 13th one. Or someone like, Thomas is like, I figured I wouldn't have one, right? Like, you don't have any of that. You have 12 baskets with 12 apostles. So whether they carry them or not, the numbers just match up. God, God uses numbers. 
He's intentional with numbers. 40, 40 is the number of testing. It's very intentional in the Bible. 40, 40, 40 is very intentional in the Bible, as is 12. 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 baskets, as is three. So you, you see this in the scriptures. So what we really add with at the end of the story is this amazing story in the context of verse 13 on that Jesus went to be by himself. He's pulled out of that situation. He's ministering to a multitude that came from all the surrounding cities with five loaves and two fish. He performs this miracle that feeds everybody to the full, more than 5,000, and there's 12 baskets left over. And that's essentially the end of the story. Now, next chapter, he does it again with 4,000 people, and we'll get some insight on that, that he speaks in that one, or the text gives us in that one, that this one doesn't give us quite the same insight. But we see here as we think about the 12 baskets that end the story, really, I suppose, apart from Jesus being in a deserted place by himself, what begins the story is the words multitudes, because we have multitudes, multitude, multitudes, multitudes, the words used repeatedly. But this phrase in verse 14 where it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Now we saw this back in earlier on in Matthew where it says Jesus looked upon the multitude as sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion. Isn't it comforting to know that when God looks at humanity, he's moved with compassion? In all of our folly and failures and foolishness and all of our strengths, our triumphs and tragedies, it's just so good to know that when the Lord looks at you and me, because I don't know what you think when you look in the mirror. In any given day, it could vary, right? But when the Lord looks at you with all your strengths, when you feel super excited that you did something good, or all your discouragement when you feel down because you came short or just embarrassed yourself or something like that, he's moved with compassion. God's for us. You need to be reminded of that tonight. God is for us in all of our weakness, all of our depravity, all of our failures, all of our insecurities. God is for us. We need to know that, that God is for you. God loved the world. He gave his son to die on the cross for our sins. He is for us. He's 100% for you. And it's proven through Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the grave for our hope and justification. We need to know Jesus is for us. Like, you should never, ever doubt that God's not moved with compassion for us in your worst moment. He's for you. I know he's for me. And in my worst failures, no matter how bad I feel, no matter how discouraged I might feel, I never doubt that God is for me. Nor should you. Now you might have to be humbled and chastened and learn some lessons and pick yourself up. But don't ever doubt that God's not for you. He is for you. And so in this story, really what we get contextually is a lesson for the apostles. I believe personally as a pastor for 36 years, that what Jesus is doing here is he's teaching these apostles how to do ministry. That's really the context, how to do ministry. Because you can be prepared to do ministry going away to Bible college or seminary or whatever, but, you know, once you get out there in the real world and you're pastoring churches, you just got to, you got to be spirit-filled, spirit-led, and you got to humble yourself and take the death sentence that the Holy Spirit gives you and keep growing and going forward. You'll never make it. Nine out of ten church plants fail. And I'll tell you, I've become convinced why most of them do fail is the people that are called to do them get discouraged and they quit too soon. Because ministry can be discouraging. It can be disheartening. It, it, it'll break you. And it just happens. You get, you get discouraged because to be the greatest in the kingdom is to be the servant of all. And it's hard to serve other people. It's hard to serve other people when they say thank you. It's much harder when they don't say thank you. It's the hardest when they try and destroy you, right? We all, if you're serving Jesus, you've experienced this. It's hard to serve even when people say thank you. It's hard to serve when they just are indifferent. It's really hard to serve people that try and destroy you. But the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. Salty the singing songbook used to say back in the 80s, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to learn to be the servant of all. And Jesus said, if anyone come after me, male or female, let them deny themselves and pick up their cross daily and follow me. And the cross is a death sentence. It's a death sentence of pride, selfishness, carnality, and all these things that the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve have in our sinful nature that the Holy Spirit wants to go after from here to the day of the Lord. And that's why we need to pick up our cross. we got to keep letting the Lord peel away the layers that are contrary to his character in us, his purposes through us and just keep making us more who we're meant to be in time that would be that much more ready for what he has for us in eternity that's the key and that's it 
So this contextually is a lesson on ministry. But I do think there's some broader application for all of us in our lives in general. So may the Holy Spirit speak to you as we look at that. But really, it's lessons in ministries. And what we really learn from the story is that God's able to do all that he wants to do. Right? Isn't this really about what God's able to do? Ephesians 3 tells us he's able to do above and beyond all that we could think or ask in his church for his glory. And these guys are going to change the world. These guys are going to go from the upper room in Acts chapter 1 and the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They are going to change the world. And us being here tonight is an extension of the world they change on April 6, 2024. We are here from what these men who said, tell them to go buy their own food at 7-Eleven, if you will. These men in this story, they're the ones that change the world. And it's been rightfully said, the church in each generation is Acts chapter 29. If you don't know it, the book of Acts is the history of the church, but it's only 28 chapters in one generation. And we just keep passing the baton. Jeff Johnson's memorial was today, the legendary Calvary pastor, Jeff Johnson's memorial was today. Calvary Chapel Downey, man changed the world. 50 years of incredible fruit serving Jesus Christ. And as I watch these great leaders from the Calvary Chapel movement, one by one, step into eternity, not just Steve Mays and Jeff, Pastor Chuck and these others. The others are coming behind them. These guys are older than me by 10 years. John Corson, Mike McIntosh, Raul Reese, these guys are still serving the Lord. But there's so many more that were just like them that weren't in the book Harvest. There's so many more that weren't, they're evangelists, but they're not great glory. And they don't fill the stadium, but they fill the kingdom with their witness and their testimony. And as they're going into eternity, what's happening from that Jesus revolution generation is they just passing the baton on, right? So we're Acts 29. Any of you ever have kids do track and field? Raise your hand. Anyone do track and field? Any of you do track and field? All right. Any of you, yeah, okay, it's okay. Did any of you do a relay race? Anyone do the 4 by 400 4 by 100 right? That baton is everything. My daughter Hannah ran the 4 by 400 JV, her sophomore year at Calvary Chapel High School. Leah ran the 4 by 100 She was the lead right out the gate. So boom, the 4 by 100 just like bang, bang, bang. 4 by 400 400 is a funny race, isn't it? One time around the track. It's not really a sprint. It's not really a distance. It's a funny race. But you pass the baton. So the lessons what these guys learned that changed the world, they pass the baton every generation. And as people like Pastor Jeff step into eternity, it's our time. They've passed the baton to us, Pastor Chuck and these guys. So again, the context is kingdom, and it's God being able to do above and all that we could think or ask. But in your own personal life, there might be some application that that gets a little broader for you. But as we think about 12 baskets, because what we need to take away tonight from this passage is that on a point where Jesus was trying to be alone and in a desolate place, he was pulled into that ministry, he fulfilled that ministry, and he, he taught the disciples how to do ministry at that time under those circumstances, and it was all said and done, they were leaving with a lot more than what they came with. It multiplied. The ministry multiplied in that difficult time under those difficult circumstances. And there's lessons for us. Twelve baskets. One thing that we want to see right off the bat, the first thing, is that man's perspective can be very limited, isn't it? And it can be. We, we develop opinions quickly. We can do this. We can't do this. This will be successful. It won't be successful. Based upon the odds and those who've come before us, this could work. This won't work. You do that in your businesses. You do that in your personal life. We just, we have pretty quick opinions of what we think can work or not work. And in many cases, you're paid to be able to figure out something. Will this work or not work? Is it, for example, if you're an auto mechanic, someone say, hey, is this worth worth? Is this worth fixing? Because those guys told me it'd be $1,800 to do the tranny on this vehicle. It's, I don't know if it's worth it. And they're like, no, it's not worth it. Even if you fix it, you're only going to get 6,000 6, miles out of it, right? Like, and, and so their opinion matters. So we value opinion with people that skill, have understanding. So we're not looking down on people's professional opinions or your life experiences that gives you insight on certain things. But there's a reason Solomon said to trust in the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding, but to acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and let him direct your steps. Because sometimes what we see, sometimes our opinions of the past or what we see or what we think, they can cloud our a judgment for what the Lord really wants us to do and what he has for us and what he wants us to see. So look what these guys saw. It says in verse 15, when it was evening, it's gotten darker, right? So we have a description of what's been going on. When it was evening... 
his disciples came to him. I think we all know what it's like to go to God and tell him what we think he should be doing, right? <laughs> don't we all do that sometimes? Hey, God, I got a really good idea. I get a big raise. God's like, I got a good idea. Why don't you earn it? Right? <laughs> but we all get like this. God, if I was running the universe, well, you're not. And that's a good thing, too, by the way, on behalf of the rest of humanity. It's good I'm not running the universe. It's good you're not running the universe. Because even the best of us would run into the ground. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-able. And he's holy. In him is light. There's no darkness at all. It's a good thing he's running the universe. He doesn't have a skewed thought or perverse thought toward any of us. That's a good thing. It's a good thing he's running the universe. But they came to him and said, this is a deserted place. Right? I think Jesus knows that already, right? This, it's almost comical to some degree. Hey, Jesus, it's getting dark, and there's a deserted place, in case you haven't paid attention to what's going on around you. And the hour is late. Send the multitude away. See, they looked at the situation. Late, dark, no stores open. Deserted place. They assessed the situation and said, you know, essentially they're saying is we don't want to be responsible for these people, so send them away. Look what they say. Send them away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, as, let's just, let's just look. If these people, they chose to follow you, and if they didn't bring a lunch, that's their problem. And so let's just send them away. I mean, the, the common sense thing here is we cannot feed 5,000 people. We can barely feed ourselves. So let's send these people away so they can go take care of their business. Then we'll just pick up this ministry at some point down the road on the other side of the, the Sea of Galilee or something. But let's just, let's call it a night right now. Let's just say we're done here. See, man's perspective can be limited. I just want to remind us tonight, often when we're praying and planning about our future and we're thinking about what the Lord has for us, and what well, the Bible says, a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And James said, come, come you who got it all figured out. Come you who got a good plan for next city, so-and-so, such-and-such. You should say, if the Lord wills, we'll do such-and-such such a thing. You see, that, those always speak to me because I'm a planner, right? I've always got vision. I've got goals. Everything falls into four square. I can organize my thoughts on what four things need to be done. The, most, the four most important things, and I know what the next thing is. It's always my bottom cornerstone. My mind works that way. So, you know, I have to pay attention when the Lord's like, just saying, that's not, that's not how it's working today. I just shared this in a study a couple weeks ago when Jeremy Foster was in town. And the Lord's like, no, you're not. That plan you had between 10 and 2 on that Tuesday, forget that plan. You're a good friend, former assistant pastor's in town. And you're going to, don't you want to spend time with them? I do. Then that's the new plan. That's the new plan. If they want to see you in the one day of the year that you can see them in person, let's do that. And what you're going to do between 10 and Tuesday, what you're going to do between 10 and 2 on that Tuesday we can just, we can, we can pivot on that. We can recalibrate that. We have our plans and our, our thoughts and ideas. This is a problem, by the way, in ministry when people running churches tell God how to run his church. See, there's lots of churches with boards of directors. They got all the plans and they'll tell Jesus, it's too dark, it's too late, send them home and tell them buy their own food at 7-Eleven. What you need in leadership is men and women who are like the book of Acts in prayer, seeking the Lord, waiting on the Lord till the room shakes with the word of the Lord. And they hear from the Lord and they let God guide their steps and they let God direct their paths and they make spirit-led decisions instead of man-led decisions. The flesh as a whole, our fleshly nature and fleshly men and women, we tend to like quick things, like in and out burgers. See, most cultures like to enjoy a meal and chit-chat for one to three hours. When I used to go to Chile all the time, I had to totally shift gears. It's like when you get off the plane in Honolulu and you're headed for the North Shore going 70 miles an hour. Like, why? You can't go 70 miles an hour on the H1 going to the North Shore on the Cam Highway. You got to slow down like 35. There's kids in the back of a truck with a dog going 30 miles an hour in a one lane. You, just, you, you have to shift gears. And when I go to Chile, what always got my attention right away is we, I would come from California with In-N-Out Burger mentality like, hey, 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 we want some service right here. If they're slow at Starbucks, you're like, what? What's wrong with you people? You're getting paid minimum wage to serve me quickly. That's how we think here. we go to Chile and be like, hey. And we'd sit down. At like, when's, when are we eating dinner, by the way? It's like midnight right now. We got here at 9. See, to slow down. 
The Lord wants to slow us down. See, we want quick solutions. We don't want things that inconvenience us. We don't want things that require us out of our comfort zone. But the things that inconvenience us and the things that take us out of our comfort zones are the things that will cause personal growth and development in our life with the Lord. So we need to slow down. We need to be presented with situations that we don't have answers for so we learn not to lean on our own understanding but to look to the Lord to find resolution for those situations. The Lord will create problems for us so we'll look to him for resolution of those problems. There's no depth of character for men and women who have no problems and no obstacles. But there's plenty of depth of character for men and women in Christ's name who overcome obstacles because they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. And their testimony of how they came through an obstacle that became an opportunity becomes a testimony of faith to Jesus Christ. For themselves when they look in the mirror, for their family as they guide their kids, and for their neighbors as they see their faith on display. It's not what happens to us or what's going on around us, but how we respond to it that develops growth. So the Lord is going to want us to learn to, to let him read the situation and determine how he's going to resolve it and not look for us to have a quick fix. We're the super glue world. Like, that's how we are. That's how I am. And we can't just throw 5,000 people under the bus and say, go buy your own food down the street. That's not the solution. And I think sometimes we come up with those solutions with the Lord. So I think what we need to take first of all from this text is, yes, we can have quick decisions on what we think is going to work. Obvious decisions. Because there's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And we, knowledge is the facts. Understanding is what it means, and wisdom is the right decision. As a whole, that's the way it works. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is things that we don't see or fully understand. And so wisdom and faith are like next-door neighbors, and they, they learn how to work together in our life. What if this ministry was done, what if Jesus obeyed the apostles right here and he just sent everybody home? What if that had been the conclusion of this story? You'd be like, okay, so let's imagine just for a minute just having, you know, let's get in character. Um, so if we read verse 15, and when the evening his disciples came in saying, this is the deserted place and the hour is already late, send the, the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. What if it said, and so he did? Oh, that'd be terrible. And then we just picked up like verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in a boat. We'd be like, that was the end of it? The disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, send them home. Like, can you imagine? Aren't you glad there's like the rest of the story? Because this is the heart of man and man's perspective. Send them home. But the rest of the story is the heart of God. Which brings us to the second thing. If man's perspective can be limited, God's perspective is unlimited. And God's perspective is always one of just the impossible. How many times do we read in the Bible, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible? How about Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those promises are there for us for a reason. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Though I'm with you always till the end of the age. The miracles, the most beautiful thing our lives can experience is to see the supernatural hand of God upon our life. The most beautiful thing that we can see in the human experience is to be a son of Adam, daughter of Eve, redeemed by the blood of Christ, and to see the supernatural happen in our life. To see a miracle happen right before our eyes when you know in your heart and your soul before the living God that happened just for you in a universe of 8 billion people, you know Jesus Christ is right there with you by the power of the Holy Spirit pulling that miracle off. Miracles are beautiful to see. And there's little miracles all the time where you see the fingerprints of God on your life. And then sometimes there's bigger miracles where something very profound does happen. That's amazing what the Lord does. But I'll say this. I have found in my journey the one who is looking for miracles is generally the person who finds miracles and has miracles. But the one who doesn't look for miracles or believe in miracles, well, we go back to what the Word says, the Word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If he's already spoken to you and you haven't responded to it, why would he give you a miracle? Because to the one who has, more is given. And when Jesus gives more, he gives it from the person who had something and didn't do anything with it. So if you want to see the supernatural, wake up believing in the supernatural. If you want to see the Lord do something really special, make yourself available for the Lord to do something really special. If you want to be in a comfort zone, be in a comfort zone. It's the most dangerous place to be on earth. If you want to grow in faith and grow as a person and be better prepared for eternity in the day of the Lord, then get out of our comfort zone and let God's perspective rule our life and let's see him for unlimited great things that he could do. Remember the tree, the fig tree, where he cursed the fig tree and it withered 
And the apostles were like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. He just cursed this fig tree and look at it. Peter's like, look at it, Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm telling you, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it'll be moved. Now that might be a hyperbole, but it's teaching them to have faith. In John 14, before he departed to go to glory, that very Jewish day, he said, the things you see me do, you can do more. Isn't that amazing? What an incredible promise that Jesus would say, the things that you've seen me do like this, you can do more. And if you study church history for 2,000 years of people who've taken that baton, if you will, in the relay race of the church of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the light to the world, those men and women that we esteem and admire so much their testimonies are filled with so many miracles and the power of God upon their life because they let, the God, they let the God of miracles demonstrate his power of God upon their life. They made themselves available and they just kept going forward and everything was framed with faith. So no matter what setback they faced, no matter what heartbreak, they still kept on the point, kept going forward, forward, over and over with the Lord and they saw God do incredible things. I think of Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China. The the vision he had as a teenager to go to China, his discipline in his late teens to study Mandarin, to go out street witnessing in London to practice sharing his faith in the dialect he knew while he was learning the new dialect, his going to China out of his comfort zone, his changing his appearance to be like the Chinese and diffusing the Western world colonialistic image to the Chinese people. And then going out to the inland areas of China where, they were for, where the established missionaries were forbidding him to go, going against the people of the church who said, you can't go there. Professional religious people, and he did it. And how he buried children he loved there. All the heartaches he went through. But the one vision never ceased to see a church planted, a Christian witness in every single inland province of China. Every single one of them. You know, China's a big country. Ever look at it on the map? It's huge. You think we have different dialects, Arkansas, Maine, California, North Carolina. China is filled with different dialects and accents. Hudson Taylor made it his life goal to go to every one of those inland, mission, every one of those inland provinces in a country that was essentially at civil war under colonialism. And he succeeded in his vision. Isn't that amazing? He succeeded in his vision. He could have had all the excuses in the world, all the discontented missionaries that came and caused problems and turmoil for him and his wife and the things he went through. It didn't stop him. Those obstacles became opportunities. He just was so relentless. It says of Jesus in Luke 9, he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He was going to the cross no matter what. And that's how we need to be with the call of God. And Hudson Taylor did all those things, and he did, in fact... Plant a Christian witness in every single inland province of China. What an inspiration. That, I mean, isn't that amazing? At the same time, these American billionaires like Vanderbilt and Rockefeller and these guys were just, Carnegie were just making billions and billions when they didn't exist. And they seem to be so wealthy to the world. Here's this man in China changing the world and the universe with his faith and his obedience. How many miracles did Hudson Taylor see in his journey of life to see a Christian witness in every inland province of China? Who can know? Well, if you get to heaven, you can ask him. It's amazing. What's even more amazing to me about Hudson Taylor is the inland China mission that he started, it still exists today. He stepped in eternity 120 years ago. How many people did something great and the legacy of their life still goes on 120 years later? Now, it's not called the Inland China Mission anymore, but it changed its name, but it still exists, and it's still doing Christian witness all over Asia and other parts of the world. Isn't that amazing that you can be gone four or five generations? His grandson served on the board leading it back in the 50s and 60s. Like, what kind of a legacy do we want? Do we want our, life, our legacy to be to our kids and our grandkids, a legacy of faith and our, or a faith with an unlimited perspective with a God of miracles who can change the world right in front of our eyes? Or would our legacy be like, I just don't see how it's going to work and it's too hard and I'm just over it? Because most people say the latter of those two things. It's our, it's our choice. But 1 Corinthians says run to win. So when you receive that baton, don't run just to participate. 
We're told to run to win. That's not Coach Joy from the U.S. Olympic Committee saying that. That's Paul the Apostle under the Holy Spirit saying that. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty inspiring. And it was Paul who said, whatever you do, so if you're running for the Lord, do it with all your heart. So run like you mean it. Run the 4 by 100 like you mean it. The 4 by 400 like this is it. You, you, go, you go big and you go for the gold. And you, you see God's perspective and you see the God of miracles and you let him do it. Have faith. And the final thing we see is in, that was back there in verse 16 because you know, Jesus said they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And he said to them, we only have five loaves. And he said, said it to me. So he, he said, you know, find the solutions. Make it happen. You know, go with it right here. Do something with what you have. The God of miracles. See God's perspective. God's perspective is that five, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish can, can feed 5,000 people and have 12 baskets of leftover. That's a perspective we need to have. That's a perspective he's trying to teach him, and that's a perspective he wants us to have. But the last thing we see here is verse 18 where he said, bring them here to me. And this is the key with everything. Let God bless and multiply and even break what he's doing. It says that he, Jesus, he blessed them in verse 18, uh, verse 19. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave the multitudes. But he blessed, he broke, and he gave. He blessed and he broke and he gave. So it's kind of that availability factor, but when we, when we choose to let, see things the way God sees them, that the God is in charge of the universe, that there's nothing too hard for the Lord, that he is a God of miracles, and we look for that, then we can see him do things like this, and it really just becomes like, he's Jehovah Jireh, he can do whatever he wants, and, he, and we let him do it. So we bring our five loaves and our two fish, and he, he can do it. He, can, he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it away. And that's really what he's doing with our life, isn't it? If you think about it, hasn't everything Jesus Christ in our life been a blessing? I mean, you can say no if you want to, but that won't look good on the game film in eternity. Because, well, it's not true. Even if you think that, it's not true. It's not true. What is true is that everything, everything you let Jesus Christ do in your life is a blessing for you. For your spirit, mind, body, soul, the person you are here and now in time and for who you're going to be in eternity. Everything, everything, 100%, everything is a blessing. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, we're told when God created the universe in chapter 1 and 2 and he made man his image, it says that God blessed him and he said be fruitful and multiply. God's math is always to multiply his kingdom in and through our lives. He's a blessing God. But many times that multiplication comes through the subtraction of the things that are contrary to God and offensive to God. So it's kind of paradoxical. He's got to subtract that which is holding back the blessing so he can pour out the blessing. That's the work of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying work. He did it in them. He's doing it in us. But he multiplied what was available. And it's just, again, another reminder of what we say in the Calvary Chapel movement. It's not our ability, but our availability. But we, we usually refer to that as our availability of our time and energy, but just how about the availability of our resources, our total person? The, the apostle said, this is all we have. We have five loaves and two fish. If those five loaves and two fish were not brought to Jesus, what happens? Well, it doesn't happen. God chooses to work through people. He choos, chooses to work through our availability, our time, our energy, and our resources. It never just falls out of the sky. It's like what we put out comes back. The reason Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse can be entrusted with so much wealth to do so much around the world is he was proven four decades ago when working for his dad when he traveled the world doing relief for his father's ministry, the BGEA, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And when Franklin learned those lessons in his 30s and his 40s, it was constantly shaping him and preparing him for what lies ahead. And now he's the guy that can go where none of us can go with his shoeboxes and with his relief planes. He can go to Pakistan with the gospel. Most of us cannot. See, if you learn to give the Lord the five loaves and the two fish this day, and you watch him multiply it, then you learn in the future to give him more, and he can multiply that. See, that's, that's the key. But if you never give him five loaves and two fish, would you ever experience a full basket of leftovers? How could that happen? You don't get 12 full baskets of leftovers without giving up the two loaves, the five loaves and the two fish. So she's a great lesson to us that in serving the Lord, we bring what we got. We, we don't, we, 
Don't let our perspective hinder what we can think God can do. So we need to like, okay, this is how I see it, but Lord, you know, you've got, you've got a bigger vision. There's, a, there's more at work here, and we acknowledge that, so we're going to acknowledge you in all of our ways and let you guide us, and we're going to believe that you're the God of wonders and the God of miracles, and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and you honor those who live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please you, so we're going to live by faith. We have all these heroes of the faith that we can learn from, and we're going to go for it. And here it is. Here's what we got. Here's what I got as a teenager. Here's what I got when I'm 80. Here's what I got. We got to be all in. The woman who's all in sees more supernatural. The man who's all in sees more supernatural. The married couple that's all in, they see more supernatural. And you think, well, it's hard to be all in. Well, it's hard to not be all in. It's better to be all in because then it's the Lord's. So it's a great story for us, like not to let our own perspectives hinder the ministry of the Lord or the work of the Lord in our life, to have God's perspective on the ministry, God's perspective on what he's doing in our life, and to know that he can do above and beyond what we think, and to know to have his perspective on our ministry calling and what he has for us, and to realize that God wants to bless. And he, he's a blessing God. He wants to bless. He wants to take us forward. And when it's all said and done, on the day of the Lord, wouldn't it be nice to have to, uh, a full basket, huh? Your 12 baskets? Wouldn't it be nice that you started this journey with Jesus with five loaves and two fish and you end with a full basket, huh? That's, just, that's the lesson. So, Lord, we thank you for your word here tonight and its application to our lives. And... Uh, it's a, it's a well-known story. I think I speak for most of us, if not all of us. We know this story, and it is a story of miracles. It's a story of meeting needs. It's a story of a multitude. It's a story of the apostles' perspective. It's a story of the kingdom perspective. It's a story of you blessing and breaking and, and giving. And it's a story that ends with this amazing truth that there was 12 full baskets left over. And there's plenty to think about there for us as we meditate upon your word and look to apply it to our lives. So God, we thank you for your word that works effectively in us who believe. We thank you that all the promises are yes and amen. And we know that you've got good things for our life, Lord, and you want to bless us. And even though we live in a world where there's darkness and evil like Herod the Tetrarch, ultimately there's work to be done. There's our generation to fulfill. And now is our time. So guide us by your spirit and help us in this journey, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, God bless you guys. We're available for prayer afterwards. As always, have a great Sunday, a great week. Hope to see you out on Tuesday. And as I mentioned, Danny Donald will be here. And once again, guys, hope to see you on Saturday in the morning. Let's all stand for this closing song with Danny. Be blessed, be encouraged, have faith, have vision. God bless. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God is still rolling stones away. Yeah. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. 
Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Oh, we were the beggars. Now in royalty, we were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Yeah. We shout out your praise. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.